Hello, this is uh, Professor Fournay, and this is week five of the macroeconomics course. And this week we're going to take a look at um, fiscal policy, different types of fiscal policy, uh, look at issues involving the budget deficit, and a larger, more cumulative issue, the national debt. So chapter 30 focuses on fiscal policy, deficits, and debt. Alright, so to begin this chapter we have to look at uh, the basic tools of fiscal policy. And fiscal policy is where the government uses the tool of government spending and our taxation to try and rid the economy of recessionary expenditure gaps or an inflationary expenditure gaps. So the objective of fiscal policy is to use the tools of government spending and our taxation to try and eliminate any type of economic gap in the economy. So again, a recessionary gap is just code for recessionary conditions. An inflationary gap is just code for a fast-growing economy. And the concern there would be the onset of inflationary pressure. So you use the policy tools to try and alleviate those uh, economic concerns. All right, when it comes to fiscal policy, there are two types. Uh, one type is called expansionary fiscal policy. And the government considers going down the expansionary path, expansionary fiscal policy path, when the economy is experiencing recessionary expenditure gap. So when a recessionary expenditure gap exists, the fiscal policy will be invoked so as to try and make the economy expand or grow out of the recessionary conditions. Um, the tools that you will use for expansionary fiscal policy, you, if you use government spending, you want to increase government spending. Because an increase in government spending will cause ultimately an increase in income, which will cause the economy to grow. The other option would be to reduce taxes. So if you have recessionary conditions and you reduce taxes, taxes would indirectly, reducing taxes would indirectly make consumption bigger. And consumption is by far the largest expenditure in our economy. So if consumption expenditures go up, income goes up, and the economy starts to grow out of the recessionary conditions. Now, in contrast, if the economy is growing too fast and you have inflationary gap, expenditure gap concerns, uh, then you want to slow the economy down. You want to slow down the, the growth, the runaway growth in the economy so that you have to contend with inflationary outcomes. And so what you do is you use the tools the opposite way. Here, instead of increasing government spending, you would decrease government spending. Because if you reduce government spending, income drops. As income drops, the economy starts to shrink or contract. If you wanted to go the tax route, uh, it's not politically <laughs> politically uh, advantageous to do so, but economically, if you increase taxes, that would reduce consumption. Consumption falls, income falls, and the economy starts to contract. So which fiscal policy path you go down depends on the type of gap that is detected in the economy. And so we want to look at is how we would use these tools precisely and how they would affect income precisely uh, once they are utilized. All right, so to determine how, how much to change government spending. Again, if there is a recessionary gap, expenditure gap, you're going to increase government spending. If there is an inflationary expenditure gap, you want to decrease government spending. Now, how much you change them is going to be a function of uh, in the case of a recessionary expenditure gap, the increase in government spending should be large enough to cause aggregate expenditures to increase so that the aggregate expenditures will then equal real GDP at full employment. So you're, you're using the fiscal policy tools to affect the aggregate expenditure function. You're going to make that aggregate expenditure function bigger by the increasing G, are increasing C. You make the aggregate expenditure function smaller by decreasing G or by using taxes to decrease C consumption.
So you're using uh, government spending to make the aggregate expenditure function bigger or smaller. Right. And, all right. Now, once you change government spending, that's going to then kick in the multiplier process. So if you have a recessionary expenditure gap and you increase government spending, you would the, the ever how much you increase government spending, that times the spending multiplier will tell us how much real GDP will ultimately increase. So you take the multiplier times the increase in government spending and that helps you determine the increase in real GDP in the case of recessionary gap. Now in the case of an inflationary expenditure gap, you're going to reduce government spending. And ever how much you reduce government spending, that times the multiplier will tell us how much real GDP will decrease. So remember, because an increase in expenditures has a multiplied effect on income, a decrease in expenditures has a multiplied effect, but a decrease in income. All right. So that gives me kind of guidance in terms of how much to change government spending, uh, given the the economic gap that I'm confronted with. Now, how much how much you change taxes and how you do it uh, is is a little more uh, cumbersome. Because taxes don't, taxes work indirectly on consumption. So, for example, when you change taxes, that's going to make income change. And as income changes, that will then change consumption. And how much consumption changes will be predicated on the MPC. Because the MPC tells us how much consumption changes as income changes. So, if income goes up and we know the MPC, we take that MPC times the increase in income and that will tell us how much consumption would increase. And some of the income of course will go into savings because remember DI is equal to C plus S so if income goes up, consumption goes up, savings goes up. How much savings goes up will be determined by taking the MPS times the change in DI. All right? So taxes are indirectly influencing consumption. And the trick is to change taxes enough so that you make consumption change enough to make aggregate expenditure change enough to where aggregate expenditure will equal uh, real GDP uh, at full employment. All right, let's see if we can work through it. Let's look at an example of how much to change taxes. Let's say that, um, that uh, real GDP at full employment, determine how much you change taxes, you take real GDP at full employment minus the corresponding value of aggregate expenditure at full employment. So you take whatever real GDP is at full employment and subtract from it the value of aggregate expenditure at full employment and then you divide that by the MPC and it will tell you how much you need to change taxes. For example, let's say that in some economy the MPC is 0.8. And real GDP at full employment, we'll say, is 2500 And let's say the corresponding aggregate expenditure at full employment is 2400 So aggregate expenditure is less than real GDP at full employment. So we need to increase aggregate expenditure to where it will be the same at, as real GDP at full employment. And then we would have equilibrium at full employment. And so to determine how much we need to cut taxes, in, in this case, because we have a, a recessionary expenditure gap, we would cut. We would take the value of real GDP, which is 2,500 in this example, minus aggregate expenditure, which is 2,400. 2,500 minus 2,400 divide that by the MPC, which is 0.8, and this tells us we need to cut taxes by 125 billion. So we're cutting taxes by 125 billion with the objective of making consumption increase enough to make aggregate expenditure increase enough to equal real GDP at full employment. So you notice the aggregate expenditure right now is 2400 If I could add 100 to aggregate expenditure, it would then rise to equal 2500 and it would equal real GDP at full employment. We'd have no recessionary expenditure gap and we'd have equilibrium at full employment, which is what we want. So taking the proposed tax cut of 125, reducing taxes by 125, that's going to make income go up by 125. Now, how much consumption goes up will be 
you take the MPC, which is 0.8, multiply it times the increase in income, which is 125. So 0.8 times 125 says that consumption will then increase by 100. So if consumption increases by 100, we take this larger consumption amount of 100, add it to the aggregate expenditure amount of 2400. 2400 plus 100 equals 25, and the difference, the recessionary expenditure gap, will close. All right, and so the the same before we proceed, this if we had an opposite scenario, if it turned out that at full employment, uh, real GDP were less than the corresponding aggregate expenditure value, then we would have a case where we have an inflation or expenditure gap, because aggregate expenditure would be greater than real GDP. And so what we want to do is we want to reduce aggregate expenditure down to where it would equal real GDP. And so you would take, again, whatever the real GDP value is, you plug it in, minus the corresponding aggregate expenditure. And in the case of an inflationary gap, the corresponding aggregate expenditure amount would be larger than real GDP. And you divide that difference by the MPC. And the amount you would get would be the amount you would need to increase taxes. So, so when you have an inflationary gap, you're going to increase taxes, and the process would work uh, in reverse. Taxes would go up, income would fall, consumption would fall, and you want to make consumption fall enough so that aggregate expenditure would equal real GDP at full employment. All right, so, so that tells me how to use how much to change taxes depending on the gap scenario. And the previous slides, we looked at how much to change government spending. Um, and the change in government spending should be enough to make aggregate expenditure equal real GDP at full employment. If you change taxes, the change in taxes should be enough to make consumption change enough so that aggregate expenditure would equal real GDP at full employment. And if you can do that, that will help you to eliminate, through fiscal policy means, both recessionary expenditure gap or an inflationary expenditure gap. Now, when the government does all of this spending, uh, spending and taxing, it has budgetary implications. And so when you're looking at uh, the, the after effects of fiscal policy, you tend to be concerned with, you know, how does it affect the budget? the financial stability of the budget. And so we're looking at the federal government's budget. The federal government will have a, what's called a budget surplus when its tax revenues exceed its spending. So if the government collects more in tax revenues than it spends during some fiscal cycle, it will have a budget surplus. And we in the United States have had, the last time we had a budget surplus was like in uh, the late 90s, 98, 99 during the Clinton administration. Most of the time in the United States we have a budget deficit where tax, tax revenues are less than the amount the government spends during some fiscal cycle. So we typically have budget deficits. Another possibility uh, which would imply kind of a fiscal responsibility on behalf of the federal government but it would tend to uh, make fiscal policy somewhat less effective is if the government pursued a balanced budget. That is, where the amount it spent was limited to the amount it collected in tax revenues. If it does that, the budget balances and we have neither a surplus nor a deficit. <clears throat> now, when the government runs deficits as we typically do, the, if you take the cumulative amount of the deficit spending, so every time you have a deficit, roll that into a previous deficit, keep, it has a kind of a snowballing effect. And then you have to integrate into the snowballing process interest. Because when the government spends more than it collects in tax revenues, it will issue government securities, such as bonds. And those bonds require the government to pay interest on the outstanding bonds. And so that interest becomes a part of the snowballing cumulative uh, national debt uh, phenomenon. So think of the national debt as the cumulative amount of government spending over time plus interest that's applied to the um, 
the outstanding debt. As of November 2013, the current national debt is about $17.2 trillion. Now, we, as discussed in the textbook, the national debt can be carved up into different uh, degrees of ownership. Uh, the, the federal government owns some of the national debt, that is government agencies. Uh, the Federal Reserve owns some of the national debt. Uh, the public, through individual ownership, owns some of the national debt. There is some um, foreign ownership as well, state and local governments as well. So there are many stakeholders that have outstanding liens against the nation. But what's interesting is a lot of those stakeholders are Americans themselves. So, so uh, as the book very cleverly pointed out, uh, a majority of the outstanding debt is due to Americans owing Americans. The foreign component of the national debt, which is growing, uh, uh, is not the majority part uh, by any means. So the national debt is, is like the cumulative effect of deficit spending over time. So when the government engages in fiscal policy where it spends to try and get rid of recessionary conditions or cuts taxes to get rid of recessionary conditions, that tends to create a deficit outcome and the effect of a deficit tends to snowball as the government consistently does runs deficits over time. All right. Um, the national debt, in terms of some kind of ancillary issues, um, it, it represents this, this kind of ominous cloud over the economy, because with that many, that much in terms of uh, uh, outstanding debt obligation and interest being applied to the outstanding amount. It raises the question, what is the opportunity cost of a growing national debt? Just focusing on the interest component. I mean, for a national debt of about $17.2 trillion, let's say the, the, um, the amount of interest that would apply to such an outstanding debt, let's say it's roughly, I don't know, $600 million. So each year, the government has to pay $600 million just to settle the finance charges, if you will, for the national debt. And the opportunity cost of that is that $600 million could be used for a lot of other social purposes, like hospitals and you know, national defense, health care issues. So there are many other uses that could be used for just the interest that the government is paying on the national debt. So if, if you are concerned and looking for a, a long-term project to pursue, I think uh, making others aware of the significance of the national debt problem and how um, it tends to divert funding away from critically needed social issues, I think this would be a good project to undertake. All right, uh, last thing I want to mention in this chapter is the the concept uh, called automatic stabilizers. Automatic stabilizers can be thought of as kind of like shock absorbers for the economy. Because our economy, over time, it goes through, sometimes it hits kind of economic potholes. We have a recession, for example. And these potholes tend to have a jarring effect. And so what the stabilizers do is they make the, the jarring effect of the economy going through an economic pothole uh, less less severe, so they re they they reduce the the impact of the economy hitting kind of an economic rough patch. Now, so what stabilizers do is when the economy is deteriorating, like in recession, the stabilizers will kick in and give the economy support. So, so they support the economy from beneath. Also, when the economy is growing too fast, the stabilizers will kick in and kind of shave off some of the excessive growth. So stabilizers really have a cushioning, cushioning effect on the economy. When the economy is growing too, too fast, they kick in and reduce some of the excessive growth. When the economy is shrinking, they kick in and prevent the economy from further deteriorating. And, and there are many examples of stabilizers. And I'll mention a couple. One very prominent stabilizer is our income tax system, the federal income tax system. The federal income tax system is, is called a progressive 
tax system because as income goes up, one moves from uh, one tax bracket to another. So for example, if um, a person has meager income, uh, they're in a lower tax bracket, then maybe they you know, uh, have some interesting discovery and make lots of income, they move to a higher tax bracket. And so as their income goes up, their tax responsibility to a point also increases. And so that system, which is really designed to progressively take more of your income as it increases, is has a kind of diluting effect on excessive growth. So when the economy is growing very fast and income is rising, the higher tax rates will kick in and carve off income that would have otherwise been available for spending, which would have further accelerated the growth in the economy. So our progressive income tax system has a built-in stabilizing feature that enables it to prevent the economy from growing too much. Another example of a, of a stabilizer is unemployment compensation. So for example, if a person is covered by the unemployment compensation system, when if that person loses their job, instead of their income dropping completely to zero, it would drop to a point, but somewhere above zero. So the unemployment compensation acts as a stabilizer. It prevents that person's income and other like individuals, it prevents their income from falling all the way to zero. So it has a cushioning effect. Now, when the economy is growing fast and people are working, uh, the unemployment benefits fund is, is being further funded through, through payroll tax. And so as income goes up, the payroll tax takes a uh, larger amount of income and that prevents less spending and so it prevents the economy from growing even faster. So unemployment benefits have a pretty kind of um, uh, natural stabilizing effect. When the economy goes into recession, they kick in and give income to recipients so their income doesn't fall all the way to zero. And so the income that the recipients get, they can use it for things such as consumption. When the economy is growing very fast, the taxes, payroll taxes, which fund unemployment benefits kick in, take larger chunks of income from the recipients. That represents less income that they have to spend and that prevents the economy from growing even faster. So unemployment benefits serve also as stabilizers. So just think of stabilizers as kind of like shock absorbers for the economy. And they're designed to make the economic rise smoother so that we don't have these jarring impacts from recessions or ultimately uh, inflationary concerns. All right, so, so those are the, the basic issues involving fiscal policy. You have the two tools of government spending and taxation you will use the tools so as to make aggregate expenditure change enough to where it coincides with real GDP at full employment. So when you have a recessionary conditions, you want to increase aggregate expenditures and you can increase aggregate expenditure by making either G bigger by changing government spending or making C bigger by reducing taxes. We have an inflationary expenditure gap you want to reduce aggregate expenditure and you can do that by reducing government spending in such a way as aggregate expenditure will fall to equal uh, real GDP at full employment or you can raise taxes which would make consumption fall in such a way that aggregate expenditure would fall to equal real GDP at full employment. So knowing precisely how to use the tools will enable us to change the aggregate expenditure function so that it ultimately coincides with real GDP at full employment and we would have eliminated um, any type of economic gap. Now of course when the government spends and taxes it has budgetary issues as we saw. It can, we typically have budget deficits where the government overspends and that snowballing effect plus interest leads to the ominous national debt problem. So, so fiscal policy, how government uses its tools, uh, can help us eradicate gaps, but it also has the the after effects of budgetary cleanup issues that are 
typically necessary. All right, so that takes care of uh, chapter uh, 30 on fiscal policy. Um, please take a look at the concepts in the textbook. Try and work through um, the associated problems. Use the ideals given here in this presentation as kind of guidelines. And you will see that using the tools of fiscal policy is rather systematic. And we can use them to gain a lot of insight in terms of how the economy is behaving. All right. Take care.